Thank you for the introduction. Today, I will be talking with you about bioequivalence regulatory requirements, looking at some relevant regulations and how these regulations relate to product-specific guidances. I will also discuss the availability of alternative approaches to recommendations in product-specific guidances and the pathways that applicants can use to discuss alternative approaches with FDA. I will then describe in vivo and in vitro bioequivalence testing requirements and recommendations, again looking at some of the relevant regulations, and then describe how FDA revises product-specific guidances and how those revisions are consistent with the regulations. Final regulations published in the Federal Register are collected in the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR. FDA's portion of the CFR interprets the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and related statutes. Section 21 of the CFR contains most of the regulations pertaining to drugs. Regulations, such as the regulations included in 21 CFR Part 320, which addresses bioavailability and bioequivalence, are requirements and are binding on both the public and FDA. There are several sections included in Part 320. Section 320.24 discusses the types of evidence to establish bioequivalence. 320.24a states that applicants must conduct bioequivalence testing using the most accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach available among those set forth in 320.24b. And according to 21 CFR 320.24b, different types of evidence may be used to establish bioequivalence, including in vivo testing or in vitro testing or both. And within that section, the different types of evidence are listed in descending order of accuracy, sensitivity, and reproducibility. According to 21 CFR 320.24, B6, and consistent with Section 505J8C of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, FDA has the authority to use any other approach deemed adequate by FDA to establish bioequivalence. And FDA has significant discretion in determining the appropriate bioequivalence method for a product. The agency has authority to make bioequivalence determinations on a case-by-case -case basis using in vivo, in vitro, or both types of data enables FDA to effectuate several long-recognized policies that protect the public health, including refraining from unnecessary human research when other methods of demonstrating bioequivalence meet the statutory and regulatory standards and permitting the agency to utilize the latest scientific advances in approving drug products. Product-specific guidances, as well as general bioequivalence guidance, provide FDA's current thinking on the methodology for developing generic drugs and generating evidence to support and approval. They help to streamline generic drug product development by industry and, and assessment by FDA. Recommendations and product-specific guidances reflect FDA's thinking on the most accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach to bioequivalence testing, consistent with 21 CFR 320.24. Under the GDUFA 2 commitment letter, FDA committed to issuing certain PSGs within certain timeframes, as was mentioned in a previous presentation. But there is no regulatory requirement for FDA to publish a PSG prior to ANDA receipt or approval. If FDA determines that, as required by statute and regulation, an ANDA contains sufficient evidence that the proposed generic drug product is bioequivalent to its reference listed drug, and the application meets the other requirements for approval, FDA will approve the ANDA. As I just mentioned, and as shown in the box at the top of this slide, 
which is also included at the top of product-specific guidances. Product-specific guidances represent FDA's current thinking. They are published to facilitate and foster generic drug development and end of submission and approval, not to discourage innovation by applicants. A&D applicants can use an alternative approach to the recommendations in a PSG if the alternative approach complies with applicable statutes and regulations. Each PSG includes that statement in the box at the top of the PSG, and many PSGs contain options that provide alternative approaches to bioequivalence testing. It is recommended that applicants use the controlled correspondence pathway and the pre anda meeting pathway, if applicable, to discuss alternative approaches with FDA. And we will discuss those pathways in more detail on the next slide. At a high level, the controlled correspondence pathway can be utilized for inquiries on a specific element of generic drug development. For example, inquiries to existing PSGs, such as requesting clarification on a bioequivalent study recommended in a PSG, and discussion of alternative approaches to recommendations in PSGs. Please note that controlled correspondence is not for general questions related to product planning. And as some of my colleagues mentioned during their presentations earlier, there are some alternative approaches that you can utilize without submitting a controlled correspondence in discussing with the agency. So please keep that in mind as well. The pre and a meeting pathway, as referenced in the GDUFA 2 commitment letter, applies only to meeting requests for complex products. For example, it can be utilized for discussion of specific scientific issues or questions related to proposed study design for complex drug products without PSGs and for discussion of alternative proposals to recommendations and PSGs for complex drug products. For more information on which pathway you should utilize to discuss your specific alternative approach with the agency, you can refer to the guidances for industry, controlled correspondence related to generic drug development issued in December 2020, and formal meetings between FDA and ANDA applicants of complex products under GDUFA issued in November 2020. And both of these guidance are also listed on the resources slide at the end of this presentation. The reference listed drug is a specific drug on which an ANDA applicant relies in seeking approval of its ANDA. When an applicant submits an ANDA for a generic drug that is the same as its reference listed drug, the basis of submission is the reference listed drug. When in vivo bioequivalence testing is required, or an applicant otherwise seeks to support a demonstration of bioequivalence with in vivo data, such testing must be conducted with the drug product FDA selects as the reference standard. You can see 21 CFR 314.3b, which contains the definition of reference standard and also the definition of reference listed drug. Where the reference listed drug is marketed, ordinarily it is also the drug product selected by FDA as the reference standard. Where the reference listed drug has been discontinued from marketing for other than safety or effectiveness reasons, FDA may select a different listed drug as the reference standard. FDA generally will select a previously approved ANDA that referred to and is therapeutically equivalent to the reference listed drug as the reference standard. If there are multiple approved generic drugs that refer to the reference listed drug and have the same active ingredient, dosage form, route of administration, and strength, FDA usually selects the generic market leader based on commercial data as the reference standard. When an applicant submits an ANDA for generic drug that is a duplicate of its reference listed drug, i.e. not a petitioned ANDA, the basis of submission is the reference listed drug. Therefore, the name of the reference listed drug, including dosage form and strength and its application number, should be provided as the basis of submission on form FDA 356H and in the appropriate sections of the ANDA. 
If the reference standard selected by FDA for the drug product is not the reference listed drug, an applicant should not identify the reference standard as the basis of submission on form FDA 356H. While the reference standard is not part of the basis of submission, as mentioned before, that would be the reference listed drug, the reference standard should be identified in the relevant sections of the ANDA that include information pertaining to bioequivalents. If FDA selects a reference standard that is not the reference listed drug, an ANDA applicant must still demonstrate that its proposed generic drug meets the sameness requirements in Section 505 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. For example, the generic applicant must demonstrate that its labeling is the same as the reference listed drug, not the reference standard. You can refer to the Guidance for Industry Referencing Approved Drug Products and ANDA Submissions issued in October 2020 for more information on reference standards and reference listed drugs. And you can refer to FDA's Approved Drug Products with Therapeutic Evaluations, the Orange Book, which identifies the listed drugs that have been designated as reference listed drugs and reference standards. As stated in the Guidance for Industry, referencing approved drug products and ANDA submissions, an ANDA applicant may use the authorized generic version of the reference standard in its in vivo bioequivalent studies. You can see Section 505T of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act for additional information on authorized generics. The term authorized generic is most commonly used to describe an approved brand name drug that is marketed without the brand name on its label. Other than the fact that it does not have the brand name on its label, it is the exact same drug product as the branded product. Because an authorized generic drug is marketed under the brand name drugs, new drug application or NDA, it is not listed in the orange book. FDA publishes a list of authorized generics reported by NDA holders on FDA's website the link for which is included on the bottom of this slide, and FDA updates that list quarterly. FDA recommends that applicants interested in using the authorized generic version of the reference standard in their in vivo bioequivalent studies submit controlled correspondence to the agency to inquire further and to discuss any necessary documentation before conducting studies. In vivo bioequivalence evidence is not required in all circumstances. If FDA determines that in vivo data is the appropriate means of demonstrating bioequivalence for a product or product class, applicants may apply for a waiver of the in vivo requirement consistent with 21 CFR 320.22. For example, under 320.22 D2, for certain drug products, the in vivo bioequivalence requirement can be waived for one or more strengths based on one, acceptable bioequivalent study or studies on the designated strength, two, acceptable in vitro dissolution testing of all strengths, and three, proportional similarity of the formulations across all strengths. Note that this section does not apply to delayed release or extended release products. The PSG for an immediate release product that is eligible for a different strength waiver will include a section on the waiver request of in vivo testing, which will specify the designated strength or strengths that the acceptable bioequivalent study or study should be conducted on. PSGs for modified release products will refer applicants to the approaches in general bioequivalence guidance. There are certain circumstances in which bioequivalents can be evaluated using in vitro approaches under 21 CFR 0.24b. In such circumstances, the in vivo data requirement is not waived. Rather, in such circumstances, FDA has determined that in vitro data are the most accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach for a product, as required under 21 CFR 320.24a. For in vitro testing, the regulations do not require that an applicant use a particular product as the reference product. 
As stated in the Referencing Approved Drug Products Guidance, which I mentioned before, FDA recommends that when applicants conduct in vitro bioequivalence testing, such testing be conducted with the drug product FDA selects as a reference standard. The guidance for industry, titled Bioequivalence Recommendations for Specific Products, issued in June 2010, describes the process that FDA uses to make product-specific guidances available to the public. As mentioned in a previous presentation, new and revised draft PSGs are posted each quarter, and FDA considers comments received on draft PSGs in developing revised and final bioequivalence recommendations. The bioequivalence recommendations in PSGs are re revised as appropriate to ensure that the most up-to-date bioequivalence information is available to the public. FDA aims to ensure that policies, regulations, and scientific standards keep pace with the science of equivalence. Revisions can be classified as one major, which means the PSG is being revised to include additional bioequivalent studies or evidence recommended to support and approval. Two, minor, which is any revision that is not major, which can include revisions to provide alternative approaches to currently recommended studies. And three, editorial, which are non-substantive changes. For complex products, the upcoming PSGs for complex generic drug product development webpage the link for which is included at the end of these slides, contains information related to upcoming new and revised PSGs for complex generic drug products. Consistent with 21 CFR 320.24, the bioequivalence recommendations reflected in PSGs, new and revised, represent FDA's current thinking on the most accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach for conducting bioequivalence testing. An ANDA will not receive approval unless bioequivalence is established consistent with these recommendations or by an alternative approach that satisfies the requirements of the applicable statutes and regulations. In summary, regulations, such as the regulations included in 21 CFR Part 320, are requirements and are binding on the public and FDA. PSGs provide scientific guidance and recommendations to efficiently develop generic drug products and generate evidence to support and approval. The recommendations in PSGs reflect FDA's thinking on the most accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach to bioequivalence testing, consistent with 21 CFR 320.24 and many PSGs contain options that provide alternative approaches to bioequivalence testing. Applicants can use an alternative approach to the recommendations in a PSG if the alternative approach complies with applicable statutes and regulations. And applicants should use the appropriate pathway, the controlled correspondence pathway, or pre-ANDA meeting pathway to discuss alternative approaches with the agency. This last slide includes a list of resources that I mentioned throughout the previous slides. There are several guidances which contain helpful and useful information, the link to the FDA website where PSGs are posted, and the link to the upcoming PSGs for Complex Generic Drug Product Development website. That concludes my presentation. Thank you.